Thanks. First of all, thank you all for coming. We're going to have a fun day today. And we have um, one thing that people struggle with a little bit, and that's uh, some videos. Uh, we're kind of lucky that we can grow them here. Um, I was talking to you earlier, and I was talking about the shows we do in Florida. This was my Florida trip. I go down to the Tamiami show, and they have a special prize. You have to enter, I believe it's five plants, into their show area. They, we don't do displays down there. What they do is they have a general uh, area for, like almost like the horticor at Philadelphia Flower Show, where we just put individual plants in. So they wanted me to go up there and put these five plants in. First year we go, we roll up there, and I've got two cattleyas. You're talking about one with 40 flowers, was it? Okay, well, I had one with 25 and one with 28. But these flowers aren't this big. Each flower, seven, seven inches. Wow. So these plants are this big around and covered with flowers. I take them in there and they're like, wow, look at these things. And they have these two tables going this way. They put one here and one here up high. So you walk into like two pillars. I'm thinking, that's my plants. <laughs> this is the key though. Thousand dollar grand prize. Two hundred dollar cash prize if you just take first in your class. So I'm like patting myself on the back. Like, they don't know me. First time to show and they'll knock their socks off, right? I got second. Right? First prize was a breast of Ola Glocka, which only gets one flower per inflorescence, had 40 flowers on it. Mm -hmm. So it was like this ball of flowers. So there's serious competition down there because of the cash prize. They bring us some really nice stuff. So the next year, I'm going to top them. I pot a plant, 16 inch basket, had 33 flowers on it. And this thing was massive. It was perfect too. Flowers all the way around it, all it perfectly spaced. Everything's perfect about it. And I grew it specifically for the show. Take it down there. Second place, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we had uh, there was a Lelia Santa Barbara sunset. Which I don't know if any of you know that's an ancept type thing. It's these long spikes, the 25 spikes on it. But it. That's not an unbelievable feat by any means. That's actually something that if you have the space to grow it, would do that. You could take a plant from a five-inch pot, and I would say within eight to ten years you could grow it that big, which is not a stretch. Some of these specimens take 20, 30 years, so it can take a long time. But this was something like I was kind of like, eh. You know, first prize, come on. So, this next year, my wife and I go down. I didn't take anything big. I took cymbidiums, because they can't grow them. <laughs> I got first and second place in cymbidiums, which is no cash prize, but I patted myself on the back because I got a blue ribbon. Because in, in South Florida, they cannot grow cymbidiums. They can grow the plants fairly well. They can't flower them. And uh, they normally will grow a warmer variety. And I want to show you the difference. I uh, brought one with me. This is a newer plant. Anybody here Irish? Marshall. Marshall. This is Mad Irishman. <laughs> but you see the flower size? Yes. Small, yeah. uh, green, chartreuse color. Um, a lot of times they'll be brown or tan. So you don't get a lot of really intense colors out of the warmer varieties. What you'll get is something that'll bloom more towards summertime. But they don't need as much of a chill to get them the flowers. So there are some varieties now, they call them Florida Cymbidiums. And there's people when you go to the Tamiami show selling Cymbidiums, but they're nothing like the varieties we can grow up here. We're really lucky because we have to pay for all that heat in our greenhouses, we can grow whatever we want. We can grow cold, we can grow warm, whatever we want to do, we just have to pay for it. So, <laughs> but this is a warm growing type and it's blooming much later. As you can see, I only have a couple of Cymbidiums up here to show you. They're really on the end of their season. If we had held this two weeks ago, I probably would have had just about anything I wanted. A month ago, I could have shown you unbelievable plants, but the, the season's over as soon as it starts getting warm. So I'm going to talk about some of the keys to growing a cymbidium in your house. So some people struggle a little bit with it because of the cool temperature requirement. And we talked a little bit earlier, uh, I'm going to take questions in the talk, so just give me a second, let me finish my one thought here. We talked a little bit earlier about cold temperatures. And you would think about with an orchid, uh, like for us, if our house is 60 degrees, I mean, come on, well, we're complaining, right? 60 is the warm end for orchids. Okay, that's the cool temperature for warm orchids. Not cold temperature, that's, that's where the heat would just come on at 60 degrees. So really 60 degrees is no problem for an orchid. Our cattleyas and cymbidiums will go down low 50s, sometimes mid 40s at night. Very, very cold. So we're gonna talk about some of the ways that you can, you can do that in your house. Hey, Barbara, you have questions? Yeah, just give me the correct spelling. I know I'm not spelling Cymbidium? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know. C Y M B I C Y M B I D I U M Cymbidium. Latin so easy. Right. Uh, anybody know what it means? Any Latin major? I found this out this morning because I looked. I cheated. 
I want to give you a special. See, I can talk to you all day about culture, how to grow them, what to look for, what to do. I didn't know anything about Symbidium until this morning, as far as like where they came from. I mean, I knew where they came from. I shouldn't say that. There are 52 species. This will be on the test. Write it down. <laughs> 52 species, okay, of, of Symbidiums. Most of them come from Asia. Okay, a lot of them are from the China, China and all that. And they'll, they'll grow in very uh, cool conditions up in the mountains, but there are some warmer varieties. Most of them are cooler. In fact, the AOS one time, is anybody an AOS member? Y'all should be. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Good, okay. Uh, AOS is American Orchid Society, and they are the governing body here in the United States, and the great program, and uh, they do a lot of good work here in the States as far as uh, recognizing plants, judging things, judging shows, and all that, they do a great job. But they, in their catalog, or in their, their monthly publication, they actually had pictures of Chinese symbidiums flowering with snow on them. Very cool picture, you know, it gives you an idea how cold they can actually take it, right? So most of them come from Asia, 52 species, okay? The, the name Cymbidium is from the Latin word Simba, which means boat. So it's called the boat orchid. Never knew that before. So I learned something, you learned something that quick. So we have all different varieties of them, but like I said, smaller varieties are most of the warmer ones. This is what would be considered a standard variety now. It's a larger flower. And I cut this off because this plant was huge and I didn't feel like bringing the whole plant up here to show you a miniature flower. And on the minis, usually you get lots of flowers on the stem. And the growth habit's a little bit shorter, so instead of getting these real tall leaves, they may only grow about this big, and usually a skinnier leaf too, so they don't get the real wide leaves. And that's the reason I also wanted to bring this plant. This is a real old timer called Naomi Stark. See, real big flowers? This is a true standard, right? And that's why they were grown. But look at the leaves. See how wide they are? This is a baby plant. This plant will grow, just the plant will be this tall in a big plant. Just the plant. The spikes can be up here. It's huge when it gets full grown. So what we're breeding for in a lot of these cymbidiums to make them more of a pot plant are smaller plants, bright colors, lots of flowers. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to get the plants where they're more manageable instead of getting these really huge plants. You can even see how the, this growth habit, it's kind of this way and that way. Think about how much room this is gonna take up in your growing area. So this is a more modern variety. You can see a little bit more upright growth habit and the leaves are a little bit thinner. This, like I said, is a newer thing. Look at all the foliage that's in that plant. If that big Naomi Stark had that much foliage, the plant would be this big around. So that's some of the things we're breeding toward now. Uh, this is a fairly new hybrid, and you can see a real bright color. This is almost finished flowering, but really bright color. This is satin doll sunflower. Uh, but yeah, really pretty thing. And a lot of some babies have a fragrance. They'll smell kind of like fresh cut cucumbers. Stuff. It's kind of a sweet, fresh smell. So very attractive. Okay, so cymbidiums, uh, we're going to talk about mainly the thing is, is cool temperatures. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned they can grow up at 60 degrees is an ideal temperature. How much light do they No, no, 60 uh, is not necessarily their ideal temperature. <clears throat> when we talk about that's what I'm going to get into right now is the temperatures you want to do it. Uh, the, the, there is a trick though. Cymbidiums like lots and lots of sunlight. So to accomplish lots and lots of sunlight with lower temperatures can be a little bit tough. So I'm going to tell you about some of the ways you can do that in your house. Anybody grow in a greenhouse? One person. Okay. The rest of us are all unlucky. She's the lucky one. Well, we have a solarium that's completely glass, there you go. so there you it's go. like a greenhouse, but it's part of the house. Okay, because I know like the Stepnowskis that are here, and Joe's going to be our next speaker, they actually have two sunrooms off the back of their house and have a warm section and a cool section. Yeah. So it really makes it a whole lot easier for growing. But there's some things you can do in your house to accomplish this. So what does Symbidium need? They can go outside in the summertime, and they don't mind getting warm at all in the summer. They could be 100 degrees and they're okay. They don't mind the heat at all. But they need to get really, really cool in order to make them flower, okay? So what we usually tell people is find a spot where you can grow it outside. If you don't have a place you can put your cymbidium outside, don't bother buying it. <laughs> they really, really need it. Now, you may be okay. You may try and you may get something. But to really grow it well, you have to be able to get it outside in the summertime. They like all the air movement. They like the cool temperatures that, you know, in the evenings, how it cools off a little bit, gets warmer during the day and cools off. They really like the rain because these things can take a lot of water. Now, they're one of the few terrestrial orchids. <laughs> Most orchids are. I'm on, uh, say it like you mean it, epiphytes, right? Epiphytes. Everybody knows what epiphyte is? Anybody yeah. done? Okay, yeah. it grows up in a tree, right? But not a parasite a, because it's not taking anything, it. right? Okay, so since it's a terrestrial plant, we have a special mix for them too. This is a regular fur bark based mix, but it also has Canadian chunky peat moss in it. We use these big chunks of peat. Okay, that's for moisture retention. Because it's a terrestrial plant, they like that extra moisture. 
So they love being outside in the summertime getting rained on. The other thing, you can take your hose and just spray them down. You could spray it every day, it wouldn't hurt it. You don't soak water it, but you could spray it down with the hose every single day and they absolutely love it. So summertime, it's real easy. Get them out now, they can take almost full sunlight. Sounds crazy, right? Do you know there are some orchids that can take full sun? Even in Florida, they grow some outside of full sunlight in Florida. So orchids can take quite a bit of light, and that's one thing, if you don't have quite the amount of light you need inside, you can really push them outside during the summertime when you're developing the new growth. So you want to get them lots of light. Now, when we say not quite full sun, they need a little shade middle of the day. 10 to about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's the brightest part of the day. They'd like a little bit of shade then. That could be accomplished with the umbrella effect. Could be a small shade tree. I have a Rosa Sharon bush that's been totally, totally violated. I've hung as many as 50 plants in it and it's only like this big and thing will be like, it actually, it actually went a little so like to the side, starting to yeah, fall over because I had too many orchids in it. So I started hanging orchids on the other side to try, <laughs> but it's royally abused. But the idea there is just right because it's getting full sun in the morning, dappled light middle of the day, full sun late afternoon. That's what most of your orchids want. So you can either do this by putting up a small shade enclosure. Anybody ever put up shade cloth? Okay, it's so much easier to do shade cloth, and it's not expensive. You can get a piece of shade, I mean, it goes by the square foot, and you can buy like a five foot wide piece or whatever, and then the length you want is linear feet. But it's real easy to buy, and it's not expensive. It's so much easier, though, if you can take that piece of shade cloth and put an area out in your yard, have the shade cloth over it where they're getting light all day, but it's dappled light. That's what they work to really want. That's the, the greenhouse effect. That's why you grow so well in the greenhouse, because they get a longer day period. So you struggle with that a little bit in the house, but you can get them outside, Get them where you get that longer period, but they're protected in the middle of the day by the shade. Now, it could be done with a tree, like I said, if you have the right type of tree. We usually say dogwood, maple, birch, willow, anything that's going to let a lot of light through is a good tree to put orchids under. You should keep your orchids up off the ground. Uh, I know in Hawaii, they recommend 20 inches off the ground, which is if you take one cinder block, lay it flat, and stand one up, and then they put the benches on. That's how they put the benches out there. It's a flat cinder block, one standing up is 20 inches, and they put the bench on top of that. But what that'll do is it'll keep most of the creepy crawly insects from getting in your pots. And uh, if you have any questions on insects, you can talk about that with Joe in our next session. <laughs> yes, Barbara. Uh, in my sunroom, I have uh, treated windows mm -hmm. for the IV. Uh, UV. Uh, what about in the afternoon if <coughs> under that? If I move them over, will that? I have talked to several people about that UV filter and that found that yeah. it's really not the best thing for orchids. They actually want that full spectrum that you're blocking out. So you might struggle with higher light plants if you have a UV filter on your glass. Mm -hmm. And some bidiums are really high light. Is e, e glass is that kind of glass, is it? I believe it's it is. Called e. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what you want to do with some bidiums, so though, they really need intense light. Now, I just had a lady email me through eBay. She says, I, I had this one particular plant, you know, it's a cat type, show me what it was growing it in the morning sun. And I said, well, it's not enough light. You need to bump the light up. Said She said, wants a really bright light. She says, oh, it's in really bright light. You see that window over there? It looks kind of bright, right? That's north facing. This is the amount of light you're getting in there. Really nothing. No. You grow a fern in there. <laughs> you really, by the time, uh, like this is at 10.30, so by 12 o'clock, this southern exposure here is going to start getting light in there. And that's going to get light all the way up until probably close to 6 o'clock. So almost six hours of good sun in the south window. So you really need that intense light. And I was telling this lady, it's just that I, I didn't want to elaborate because I could tell that I wasn't going to get anywhere and she kind of cut it off so I said, okay. But morning light, even if you're getting good morning light, five or six hours, it's really not enough to push these cattleyas. In a greenhouse, we'll go 3,000 to 3,500 foot candles and it's crazy, crazy bright. But the more you push a plant, the better flowers you can get. As long as you don't start stressing it out and the leaves start changing color as far as getting a yellow or too much uh, anthocyanin shown, which would be like a purple pigment, because that's actually the plant trying to protect itself from the light, and then it converts that energy into doing that instead of blooming. But if you can really push your plants, you're going to get more flowers on them. So, cymbidiums, outside in the summer is almost a necessity. Uh, and it, it is really a necessity to do it right. What we do in our greenhouses here, we have two greenhouses that have plastic over them. We put six mil plastic on in the wintertime. We take it off about, well, any time now, about the middle of May. If we take the plastic off, and the plastic doesn't go back on usually until the night that it's going to freeze. So I'm not talking about temperatures will go down in that greenhouse. They could go all the way down to 32 as long as it doesn't get a frost. So if it's going to be the right uh, humidity and all that, we don't worry about it. But <coughs> so as soon as you start getting down near freezing, usually we'll cover it. But I'm talking about nights all the way down in the upper 30s. And that, that to us is just like crazy, but the civilians really don't mind it. 
Uh, back to my granddad said, or my dad was telling about my granddad, he said one time they walked out and all the symbiums had frost on. But they just go down and spray them with water and you actually melt the frost because the frost actually burns the plant when the sun hits it. So they actually wash all the plants off real early in the morning before the sun came up and all the plants are fine even with the frost on. So they can get really, really cold. Now, that's the first step is getting them really cool. The next thing you got to do is when you bring it in, it has to go in a cool environment. Um, our friends at Stepanowski, as Joe said, he gave up growing cymbidiums. He loved cymbidiums, but he couldn't grow them. And these guys are in Wilmington, Delaware. So they're not much different than we are. Uh, we have a little more protection uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Delaware Bay being on the side of a start temperature. We get a little bit of a break. But um, the, he was saying he could spike them, he could initiate the buds, but the buds never developed. And that's because his greenhouse was getting a little too warm. He said he even went to putting ice around the plants, which we don't water with ice. Anybody water with ice? No. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he even went to putting ice around them to try to drop the temperature because it is that important. So what you need to do is when you bring these plants in, if you can't do this, I wouldn't recommend the cool growing types of symbidiums for you, is that you need to get them into a room that you can really shut the heat down on. A lot of people have a sun porch and it's like an unheated sun porch kind of thing. They're fine out there. Really, they're fine. Even if temperature's down like 40 degrees at night, all winter, they would love it. The only thing you gotta be careful of anytime you're getting things really cold, they can't be wet and cold. And that's across the board with anything. Nothing wants to be wet and really cold. Uh, you'll have fungal problems if that happens. But they can get really cold and they'll have no problem getting cold. You'll hold the buds if you can keep them cool. So that's the important thing is once you bring them inside, you may not even see a spike yet. Sometimes they will. We used to be if we could get a plant in bloom by Thanksgiving on the cymbidium, it was early. Now we bloom beginning of October because the breeders are constantly breeding trying to extend the bloom period and they can do that with certain species. Incorporating that the summer blooming species can move the bloom period a couple of months. So they can try to get them to bloom earlier and earlier. They get them pretty early now. So sometimes we'll already have spikes showing before we even bring them inside. Those are the better cymbidiums to grow if you're trying to worry about how much or how bright you get or how cool you're going to get. Get the ones that are earlier blooming because they're going to be spiked up before you bring them inside. But you've got to keep them cool. Like now, you said night was 40, what about daytime? The daytime, it, it's not as important. They would say they'd rather not go above 80. Okay, I said 60 80 degrees degree. is the warm, the low end for the warm plants. 80 degrees is the high end for the cool plants. So if you could keep it, say, at 75 or lower, they'll love it. If it hits 80, it's not a problem. If it gets much above 80, you're going to run into a problem with buds. So you really got to keep them cool. That's the biggest thing is once you bring them inside, you have to have a place you can put them. Um, some people put them in the basement. Now you gotta have good light, so that's kind of a problem. So really your best option is a bright, sunny room that you can cut the heat down. Um, the, also in the fall, when you still have those kind of cool nights and the warm days, you can have it where you have a window open, let some air blow through. They really want something like that. So you definitely wanna try to keep it as cool as you can once you bring it inside. Now remember, they're terrestrial plants. After you bring it inside, humid in your house, and it may have good humidity in the wintertime, no, my sun porch runs 20 to 30 percent humidity, and I'm growing citrus plants on there. I'm like, I know you're not happy, but bear with me, right? <laughs> but they really get dry, so you've got to keep them as moist as you can. That's not to say you overwater them, but you really do want to keep water on them in the fall and winter up until they bloom. When things are in spike, they can take a lot more water than just their regular bloom or growing period. So if it's an active growth or if it's in bloom, more water is usually necessary for the plant. Yes. I know I brought six plants in for Bill to look at, okay? Mm -hmm. And I sent pictures and one of them, I know it's not what we're talking about, but I'm wondering if it's the same principle. I got spikes for a dendrobium mm -hmm. and I got beautiful buds, but they never opened and subsequently they fell off. Now, I, I have two humidifiers <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. going in my sunroom yeah. and even in the winter time I can keep it 45 mm -hmm. humidity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they get that morning light, but it was so frustrating because they would get to be beautiful buds, yeah. and then they'd subsequently fall off. And what I have there now has just lost its lid, but is that the same it, it, it could be. The problem is, is, I don't know if any of you guys work on cars. Oh, I like to work on cars, right? The hardest part for me is diagnosing the problem. And for an orchid, an orchid can only talk to you in a couple of ways. Its leaves can get soft, or it can drop buds. But that's really its only way of talking to you. You know, where your car, they take a plug of the computer in, and at least they can say, okay, it's this problem, you have to check these five things to see which one of these is causing this problem. With an orchid, they only show you soft leaves 
or bud drop and those sorts of things, the only way it communicates to you. So it's really difficult to pin it down. It is a <coughs> cultural problem most of the time. It could be an issue with that particular plant, but if you bought something in flower, there are some plants that this is very, very, very rare that will self-pollinate, and the flowers never open. But if it's a bud drop, it's usually an issue in the house. There are all different things that can cause it, though. Uh, it could I be, was wondering, I was wondering, mm. it's in a bark, it's mm. in a clay pot, yep. it's on the windowsill, it gets that dedicated morning light, right. it's got that now probably 50% humidity. So I was wondering, I was watering it like every five days, and yep. then I probably, I think Bill and Wolf kind of came together and thought that perhaps I wasn't giving it enough because I had it getting so... Yep. It, it, the strange thing is, you can tell me all those things, but it depends on, first of all, how much sunlight it's getting, the air movement, uh, how chunky the bark is, whether it's an open mix or, or a more dense mix. All those factors determine how fast it dries, and you can't tell unless you're every week looking at it. You'll see a gradual thing. The problem with drying a plant out is that it takes months to see it. If you take a plant and give it two cups of water, or <coughs> say a cup of water, every time you water it, you water it once a week. Two months down the road, you can pour a cup of water and you'll get a cup of water coming right out the bottom because all the bark's totally dehydrated. So it's like you got to know how much water you're giving it. You should give it lots and lots of water whenever you water it, but then make sure it's starting to dry before you water it again. So all these factors come into play. And the problem is we may not actually be able to pin down exactly what's going wrong with the plant because it probably is a small cultural issue in the where you have the plant, how you're taking care of it. All those things come into play, and it could be any one of those things causing the budget to dry. So, yes? Is there maximum humidity? Not really. Not with an orchid. you got to be careful of, of one thing. High humidity, you should have good air movement, and you don't want them to get too cold with humidity or you'll get spots in your flowers. So as long as you have good air movement and you're not getting too cold at night. We have a fan going. All the time? 24 hours. Okay. We have lights. The, the plants have 12 hours of light. Okay. Okay. We have an air conditioner. Okay. So and you, we have a you can pull the humidity out with the air conditioner. And we have a dehumidifier okay. in there. It shouldn't be a problem. Because it, it's, got enough, it's gotten up to like 80. 83, and we put the dehumidifier on and bring it down yeah. to 60. So because see, it starts getting water on Your the plants floor. are pampered. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we love them when they're booming. There you go. And, yeah. and you're going to get good results from giving yeah. them just what they want like that. But there's all different factors that can cause that. But the main thing with cymbidiums is it's the low humidity or too warm. Uh, that makes it do it. So you want to keep up cool temperatures and keep the water on them when they're in spike. They're going to be your two main factors in making sure you hold the buds on the plant all the way through until it flowers. Like I said, they'll start blooming. It used to be at the end of November. Now we get them as early as the beginning of October. So if you can get the ones that bloom earlier, better chance of flowering. Or the ones that bloom really late, you get a chance to bloom in these too. So you can get one under the other if you're not really sure if you're going to be able to do it or not. But we're really lucky, like I said, in this area that we can grow these plants. Anywhere further north is no problem. Where we are right here in South Jersey, even if you lived in Philly, you'd have an easier time than we would have here. All right, if yeah. we leave these out all summer, because I've got 11 cymbidians, mm -hmm. as you well know, <laughs> the big ones. Mm -hmm. If I leave it out and I put it on a table, mm -hmm. I have an area that the sun will come down for about four hours. The rest of the afternoon, it'll be dappled and mostly and shade. When do you get the four hours? Uh, after 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you got to be a little careful because that's that mid part of the day yeah. where you could actually burn them. The light's really intense that time of the day. Well, we have umbrellas, so I just put an umbrella up. Yeah, umbrellas are funny. I mean, you got to make sure you're giving it enough light because um, you can do it under an umbrella. Well, we have the ones that tilt the umbrellas. Yeah, but it depends on what's coming through the umbrella. Like the amount of light coming through the umbrella because you don't want to block out all the light. No. That's where the shade's really good because right. you can buy, say, 50% right. shade and you know exactly what well, you're getting. Well, we have an awning too. So, I mean, it. We but can the awnings protect. block most of the light. Same thing with an umbrella. Yeah. You're probably but blocking even, a very high percentage. Stadium, every, other, every other door or pane uh -huh. will open. Okay. So, okay. we can. Yeah. But if what, you open all of them, you're, it's. Yeah almost the same as being yeah. outside. Yeah, I wouldn't say if you haven't moved them outside and you have flowered them before. No, I haven't no, flowered just them before. Them this year. So this is a new thing for you growing yeah. some Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, you're not going to know until you try it. And that's the one problem with growing outside. Uh, I actually did a talk, one of the first seminars we did, we did on growing outside. And the biggest problem is you have to experiment before you really know what's going to happen. 
Go so take, you, the, <coughs> take the plants out and you have to maybe, the plants in. And the other thing with that is, is don't just leave them there for a couple weeks. You really got to go a month or two before you see any change in the plant. I mean, some, if it's too much light, you may burn it right away. Right. But it's not always more light than the plant needs. It may have just been too quickly. So the best thing is to get them out early because then they get acclimated to the sun before the temperatures get really hot. If you move out in the middle of June, then a lot of times you worry more okay, about so burning something. Now, but what about insects and stuff like that? Uh, the best thing to do, I'm, I'm sure Joe's gonna talk house. a little bit more about that, yeah. uh, but there are some chemicals that you can put on the plant. Usually we put things outside. We uh, put a little granule in the pot before we bring it in a week okay. or two before and water it through. It's kind of like the same chemicals that you use on your lawn to kill ants and grubs and those sorts of things. Yeah. You can sprinkle a little bit on the surface, water it through, it foams up, and it's like a total drench. It goes through the surface, <laughs> the soil, so you don't have to worry about bringing the bugs back in. As far as just bugs on your plant, like if your plant had a yeah. mealy bug or scale or something right, like that, scale, no, no, so. the natural insects outside may actually eat those bugs. Oh, okay. So you, it's a good way of getting rid of some bugs too if you have something in your plant by getting it outside. The natural insects will take care of it. Okay. When you first put them out, is it better to keep them on dappled light for the whole day or a few days? Yeah, a lot of times what we do is say wait for a couple cloudy days even. You know, that's a good way to do it too. But any of those options is a good thing. Give it a, usually a couple of weeks to kind of get it acclimated. And you could take layers of shade off. Not say you put 10 layers on, but if you say have a tree with an overhang, start back further under the tree, and over a couple week period, move it out to where it's getting a little more. <coughs> right now, just put them out under a dappled. Put a tape on. Yeah, dappled tape. But they're not getting any full sun, so I gotta. Right, so maybe start back sort of under the tree, and like I said, work it out toward the edge of the tree, where yeah, it's getting. weeks. Well, during that period. Yeah, you start out further back, and even every week you can move it out a little bit. They'll get acclimated pretty quickly. How long would you put them outside? Uh, and we're looking pretty warm right now. You have to look at your temperatures. Granddad always said the first full moon in May was your last chance of freezing. Right. We already had a full moon just a couple of nights ago. So I think this year we're going to be able to get things out a little early. But what I usually do is middle of May is normally safe for the, the colder, hardier plants. So Catlia dendrobiums, thing, not, not evergreen dendros, but cool growing dendros and those sorts of things. You're usually okay by the middle of May. Um, but take a look at your 10 day forecast before you put them out. And as long as you're good for the next 10 days and you're toward the middle of May, you shouldn't be any problem after that. And what's good for less no 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 fifties, no below fifties? Uh the fifties are okay. Fifties are perfectly fine. Like right now I think our low temperature was a night or two ago and it's fifty four. Right. And we're actually gonna be warmer from here out. That's here. Uh, I don't know what where you're from or whatever. So it depends on where you are. Yeah, they're cool but for fifties. Yeah, you really should look at the temperatures. As long as you're in the fifties, you're fine for, for the things that are like a little cooler. Warmer growing plants we don't necessarily recommend putting them out so it gets a little bit warmer. I mean we don't really recommend putting fails out at all, but if you do warmer, uh, evergreen dendrobiums, the ones that fail an opsis type, they definitely They'd rather be above 70, so you got to wait on those. Uh, otherwise, you have problems leaf dropping sort of things. But the things that don't mind the cooler temperatures, you're okay. You got to put that hand way up. Good pops back behind you, hollering at me. <laughs> this is my pop up, everybody. He's 92 years old, yeah. right? I put him to work. He works all the shows for us. Had him working all day I'm yesterday. I'm not used to seeing him yeah. sit. I'm used yeah. to seeing him. Yeah. Well, that's because he had nothing to do today. He worked yeah. all day yesterday. He worked too hard yesterday. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't spread it out. Yes. So, in summary, for the centennials, yep. after you bring them outside now and down the plate gradually, then they should be in full sunlight in the morning till 11, and from 11 to 2 be somewhat. <coughs> And then can they just stay there then for the rest of the day? Yeah. Ideally, if you had this plant right here sitting outside, you would want a canopy over it, maybe as big as the plant on each side, so three times the size of the plant. That way, the sun comes up in the morning, you got full sun all the way here, dappled light here, and then full sun late afternoon. That's what they really would like. If you can't do that, and you have a, a larger size tree where you're only getting light on one side, then you want to get light probably up toward 11 o'clock. And that should be about right for it because <coughs> even under a tree, your light intensity is probably more than you're going to get it in a window in your house. It's really amazing what the light temp or the, uh, the, the amount of sunlight you get under a tree. I actually grow some of my plants in a spruce tree, which I would never recommend. And I thought I was doing something great until last year I found some of the cat that grows grew straight down. And these are six feet off the ground. There's no branches in the lower part. So I have these orchids hanging there, catlias. And most of them, there's like breaks between the branches, so they're getting sun through the leaves of the plant. And then the, the plant's hanging maybe this far below the canopy, and it's only this far from the edge of the tree. So it's getting full sun in the morning, and then through the day, it's getting the light through the branches. So I'm thinking, it's great. Well, I had some new growth grow straight down. They're actually reaching the most amount of light, because the new growth will grow toward the, the most intense light. 
it was actually straight down. So the light underneath the tree was actually attracting the growth. I thought, oh boy, I don't know if I can do this anymore. But yeah, it's about it's twice the size of a plant, or one like, as big as a plant on each side. So you want a decent sized canopy over the plant. That's the middle of the day. If you can't do that, then get it probably closer to one side or the other if the tree is really large that you're putting it under. But there again, shade cloth is your best option, or even an umbrella. Yeah. I stole my wife's table <laughs> one year on the deck. I all my plants on the table with a big umbrella over them. It was a white colored umbrella, so I let a lot of light through. That's yeah, important. I have three of light. Yeah, if it's really dark, you're going to block out most of the light. But still, they just get, the light coming in from the sides is going to be quite a bit. And I was growing cat layers, so. Well, David, if we live in a tree that gets the morning light yep. and then the afternoon sun, the tree will shade it. Yeah, well, you can get it late afternoon if you want, but if, if you only get light from one side, you want it probably closer to the edge of the tree, to where it gets a little bit more intense light. If you're going to get light later in the day, like if it's not a really large tree, then you don't really have to get it too close to the side because it's getting both ends of the light spectrum until you're getting morning and afternoon sun on it. So every, every situation is different. But your ideal thing is the uh, shade cloth where you're getting light all day long. It's just dappled in the middle of the day. I built a little enclosure for my orchids. It looks sort of like a rabbit cage. I just took pressure treated four by or two by fours and built a little rack about this big. And then I took one by ones, it came up, made a little rack over the top, and put window screen on. Just window screen, like you buy like for a screen door. Okay? You can buy a roll at Home Depot or Lowe's real cheap. It's about 25% shade. So what I did was I put one layer on top and then I put another layer over the whole thing. So where it had a double layer on the top and a single layer on all the sides. And I have it just out in the middle of my yard. Plants grew great. I was growing cattleya, so a little higher light. I wouldn't do it necessarily with lower light plants. But even in that area, if you have a bigger plant that likes light, you tuck the one that doesn't need as much light underneath it. So there's all different ways of adjusting it. My uncle took um, PVC pipe and built a huge enclosure. I mean, it's like 10 by 10 and like seven feet high and covered the whole thing with shade cloth. He's got it sitting out in his yard. You just stake it down, you put some benches out there, put your plants on benches, and it's like growing outdoors. It's great. So much easier to water. <laughs> what, what percent blockage the shade cloth provides? It depends on the type of plants that you're growing. And you can buy any percentage of shade that you want from, I don't know, 30 or 40% all the way up to 70, 80%. I know you can get as much as 80%. But depending on the type of plants you're growing, is how you determine your shade. Like if you're going to cymbidiums, cats, 50% is enough. You could go as much as 60%, you'll still be okay. So it kind of depends. If you're going to put a shade cloth enclosure up, it depends on the trees in your yard, too. So if you have big tall trees everywhere, you don't want as much shade because this that short period they're going to get is not going to be enough to burn them. So you go maybe 50% shade. If you get light all day long, full sun, you may want to go as high as 60 or even 70%. We've grown some cattle as much as 70% shade and they do fine. Um, if you look at shade cloth on our greenhouse, you'll see that reflective shade cloth. I would recommend buying that. It's not much more expensive. The neat thing about it, each place where those little rivets cross, they're actually knotted. So the old black shade cloth would a pool in it, like a stocking, it would just kind of pull a big pool and you get this big gap in the shade cloth. This other stuff won't. It catches on everything, but the knots are, are individually tied. So you can actually just take and hook something to it and it won't pull out on you. You can take and pop little uh, grommets in if you want to, but you can actually just take the shade cloth and like bungee it right down or zip tie it right to something. You don't have to worry about having like the, the banding put on the outside with the grommet. <coughs> you don't really need to do that. What do you call this? this it's, it's reflective shade cloth, but the, the brand that we use is Illuminet. And the thing with it is, it reflects the heat. So in the summertime, you walk in our greenhouses with the Illuminet, it'll be 10 degrees cooler than it will be in our fail house where we still have the black shade cloth. Where do you buy it? You can buy it almost anywhere. I'll just type it in online on Google search. Uh, Charlie's Greenhouse, I know, sells it. But any of the greenhouse supply companies online, you can even just type in like reflective shade cloth. Uh, for, for a greenhouse or for plants and you'll, you'll find a hundred one different places to buy it and that way you can search around find the price that you want to pay and all that sort of thing but it's it's not really not that expensive I was really surprised when we went to put on our greenhouses the one thing I don't like about though it really does catch on everything yes <laughs> with our greenhouses we have uh, bar caps and they they only go the length of each piece of glass so each end has something you call on there's screws in the top it'll catch on everything so where I used to take a black shade cloth and just pull it along the thing and hook it up, now this time I have to have somebody working with me because it keeps getting caught and I have to untangle it. And I walk down the greenhouse and hook it all up on the greenhouse. So it's tons of fun. <laughs> but the shade cloth option is a great way to go. It's clean. That's the thing. If a black shade cloth, when you're done with that, your hands are all dried out and black, your clothes are black, and it just messes up everything. It's really mm -hmm. dirty. The Illuminate is not, well, it's a little dirty, but it's not bad at all. I want to talk about a couple of other plants that we can grow right along with cymbidiums because you can grow, like a lot of people are saying cattleyas. Cattleyas don't mind the cooler temperatures at all. Uh, anybody remember Brighton Farms that used to be here? 
No? George, thank you. Thanks, man. This whole open lot over here used to be, that was my granddad started. This was three acres all under glass. He grew nothing but cattleyas. But he decided that he was going to save some money on heat, start running his greenhouses at 48 degrees in the wintertime. That was cold temperature. So the boiler wasn't coming on until he had 48. He grew nothing but cattleyas. So you think cattleyas is a warmer plant, you know, coming from mostly South American things, you want warmer climates. But they can actually grow in cooler temperatures. One thing is you'll slow the bloom down a little bit. That's one thing that's nice about having all these greenhouses we have at different temperatures. We can time things for shows. So right now you're going to walk down here to see Catlia skinneri in bloom. And the thing is, I take them down to Florida and sell them because theirs bloomed two months ago. So people walk in and say, oh my gosh, skinneri, and it just, it's neat to see because it's something they don't have now. So we, we can cool things off and like get them to flower at a later time. But we can grow Catlias. We can grow a lot of the cooler type dendrobiums. Now, dendrobiums are a funny thing. People say, well, my dendrobium's not blooming. We always have to find out what kind of dendrobium is it. There's all different types. This is cute, right? See, the buds coming out. They call them like sometimes like a cigar type thing. And this is, these are the flowers. This is thrice a florum. I'll get the spike out where you can see it. Isn't that cute? And this will, sometimes these will be pure white with yellow in them. So these bloom really late. These don't necessarily have to be really cool, this type, but they do grow really well with cymbidiums. We grow all these in our cymbidium house. So thrice a florum. How, how do you spell that? What are those? Thrice a florum? Or the? Dendrobium? Yeah. D-E-N. D-R-O. E-I-U-M. Dendrobium. That's what <clears throat> Okay. This is a Novali type dendrobium. Now, what you want to look for in is trying to figure out what type of dendrobium you have is where does it flower? So this flowers on the cane. See this? It's also a soft cane, but it blooms on the cane. There, there's a warmer type dendrobium, and I should have brought one to show you what it looks like, but the plant structure is basically the same. They usually grow a little taller. Harder leaf. This has a real soft leaf, and the reason is, you see all these spots and all? These are deciduous. They drop their leaves on the flowering growth, and that's totally normal. We get a lot of calls right after the Philadelphia Flower Show. Why is my plant dying? Right? <laughs> because they're deciduous plants. They drop their leaves. But they're softer canes, softer leaf, but they flower on the canes. The only other type that does this is called a nigro hirsute dendrobium. But they'll actually have black hairs on the canes. So you can tell the difference between those and, and, and these. Now, the nigro hirsutes are warm. These are cool. These will grow perfectly right with cymbidium conditions. And they need to get that drop in temperature, just like cymbidiums. They need to get really cold in order to initiate the flowers on them. Now this is not quite as fussy once you bring it inside as a cymbidium is as far as the cool temperatures. So if you're thinking, maybe I can't grow a cymbidium, maybe you try a nobly dendrobium first. And if you can grow this well, then you can move on to a cymbidium. It's kind of like a stepping stone for you. But these come in all different colors, from pink like this to white, yellows, dark, dark purples. We have like a, sort of like a rainbow sherbet colored one, all different colors. Uh, the plants start to look a little funny, but that's okay. You just take them, just pull it off. Yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Just a leaf. Spell nobly, please. N O B. Mm -hmm. I L E. No, yeah, I had that was going to be on the test. I got my list ready for you. A plus. <laughs> I'm ready for you today. <laughs> um, hard king dendrobiums. This is Australian type dendrobium. This is very oda, but it's a, basically a king anum type. And you see little clusters of flowers. These flower mainly in the winter time. We have a few that are coming in really late this year, but normally a flower like midwinter, you're looking at probably the. Uh, February into March, that period. So these grow really well with cymbidiums. They're going to need that really cool temperature to make them flower. These smell really good. They'll smell kind of like ivory soap. They have a nice kind of pungent fragrance to them. And if you can grow a cymbidium, the perfectly uh, perfect companion plant. And uh, this looks nice, right? Everybody wish you'd grow one that big? This is a baby. <laughs> if you go to the Philadelphia Flower Show, uh, Mrs. Hamilton, you know, she said, yeah. went over there. She had one there one year. It was like as big as a table. Yeah. And you know, it's not a big feat to do that, especially when you're paying a gardener. <coughs> what is this one? <laughs> Come on, that's funny. She's not here. <laughs> what is that one called? These are, this is a King Yanum or Delicatum. I look at that. Actually, this is a hybrid, isn't it? Is it a hybrid? Specio King Yanum. So this is actually a Speciosum King Yanum? Okay. It looks just like a Delicatum or a King Yanum. But the other parent of this is a big foxtail type uh, hard cane a dendrobium. These huge stems of flowers. Um, they, are, they flower really early. That's another really good companion plant, but I didn't have it in bloom, so I didn't bring it up. When we're finished talking here, if anybody wants to smell, this one smells really good. But um, we have a specificissima, specificissima, stuck on cat leaves, speciosum. 
which is another really hard came Australian type dendrobium. They get these huge foxtails of flowers. They're absolutely beautiful and really fragrant. Um, my wife and I went to that show I was talking about the end of January, packing the truck, and I said to my Uncle Bill, that goes in the back, far away as we can, because the fragrance is so overpowering. You'll drive about five minutes and be like, oh, it smells so good. And then you're like, After whoa. A while, yeah. yeah. And the thing is, we got to blow heat to the back of the truck. So I found out in blowing heat to the back of the truck, it blows the fragrance forward. Oh, oh my gosh. So when we're coming back at the end of the show, if we have one of those plants left over, spikes get taken off. <laughs> you did the same thing in the show you're Billy and I mean, just did. You're mean. Well, the thing is with that one, the flowers and a lot of these uh, harder cane dendrobiums, the flowers don't last a long time, two to three weeks. Uh, some are a little shorter than that, but most of them you expect at least two weeks. They can go three, sometimes four, but not a real long time. But you get this beautiful big show. They make great specimen plants. You want to grow something big, the king anum types are great. And like I said, fragrance, you just don't get that, that big thing. It's like a firecracker. It disappears. Right? It's a big show. But dendrobiums are one of our favorite things to grow with uh, the cymbidiums. But like I said, you can grow pretty much any cattleya. There are a few cattleyas that are warmer growing depending on how much of a particular species they have. But um, if you're growing with the, uh, the red colored cattleys, everybody loves red. Yeah. Most of those have coccinia in them, which is a cooler grower. So they grow really well with cymbidiums. Mm -hmm. And you, you'll really develop really intense color by growing them cooler. See, in Hawaii, they grow things really fast. It's like a microwave oven. They're constantly getting new growth. Mm -hmm. But the growth doesn't harden off like it does here. Our cool temperatures make the plants slow down a little bit when it's developing the flowers. So we get bigger flowers with better color than they get. Especially with reds, they may struggle to grow red catley. We can grow it really easily here because of our cooler temperatures. So cool temperature plants are great, especially if you had a greenhouse and uh, anybody has a greenhouse, we know the heat cost can be crazy. Be like, is it really worth it? <laughs> so you can run the greenhouse a little cooler if you're growing these cooler growing type plants. And in fact, you can grow it really cool at night time. You'll save yourself a lot of money on heat costs. So it's something to think about as an option for something a little different. Cooler growing. <laughs> The trick, like I said, is when you bring it inside, it does need really bright light. And finding that really bright light with a little bit cooler temperatures is really the key. So cool temperature is going to be below 80, rather be 75 as the high. Low temperature, all the way down, even the upper 40s, totally fine as long as they're not wet. Okay, that's what you want to think about for, for warm and cool. Question? Do you feed them every time you water? Cymbidiums? Yeah. Um, this is the thing with cymbidiums. When they're growing, they take a lot of water, a lot of fertilizer. And that's true with a lot of plants, but these have a really, uh, like a, a, a very particular growing period. As soon as they're done flowering, they start putting up growth within a few weeks. Lots of fertilizer, lots of water all through the summertime. But anything that you're chilling to initiate the flowers, and always remember this, whether it's Phalaenopsis, whether it's these like nobly type dendrobiums that need that chill and they go in, anytime you're doing that, before you chill them, so you know, normally like in August here, start hitting them with bloom fertilizer. Or if you're, using, if you're using a balanced feed, you're okay. But if you have your fertilizer sitting there anyway, use bloom fertilizer as soon as you start, or even before you start chilling them, because you want to have the chemical in the plant before it initiates the flowers. Question back here. Can you substitute fluorescent light for the bright light? Ah, uh, we, we, get in office. we hear this a lot. And the, the problem in the office is like your lights are in the ceiling like this, and your plants mm -hmm. on here, you're really not changing the light that much. In order to grow it, like can work it under lights, and it's a fluorescent light. So you're like, <laughs> way up there. <laughs> so um, it's really not worth your time. I, I, one year I took um, uh, just a compact fluorescence that, and it took the big clip-on floodlights. I got like 100 watt daylight bulbs and I was growing Catley Walkeriana. For those of you that grow this plant, it blooms November to February and it wants as much light as it can possibly get when it's coming into bloom. And that's why our days get really short. So what I was doing, I'm growing a full south facing window clear glass, no shade, no screen, nothing, clear glass, right up in the window, as close as I can get. And they weren't flowering for me. So one year I said, I'm gonna take these lights. I took four of them. And I was growing on humidity trays about this long and that wide. Put these lights right behind it. Ran them from seven o'clock in the morning until one o'clock in the afternoon. And they start getting light at 11. So basically they were gonna light from seven o'clock in the morning until the sun went down. It didn't help at all. <laughs> I ran them all summer long to try it. I had them on a timer and everything. Didn't help me at all. So. You can do it. I know George grows all under lights pretty much, right? And he, he has good luck with most of his plants. But then again, you're, you're sort of limited in some of the higher light things. Some. Yeah. Yeah, so you, there's all different kinds of balances you can find. But I wouldn't worry about trying to do it in an in office situation. You're better off taking the blooming plant, having it in there you know, while it's in flower, and then taking it home or doing something else by getting it closer to a window while it's growing. Any other questions? Yeah. 
if I take care of this invidian outside and leave the other half you gotta, inside. You're gonna cut the plants in here? I got 11 yeah. plants. Oh, okay. You gotta cut one of them in half then. No. <laughs> and the, ex months, I got the, experiment, <laughs> the experiment would be, do I need to take them out or is the house with yeah. the air and everything mm -hmm. and the light that I'm giving right. it? Will harm the plant that I say in the house one doesn't bloom. Mm -hmm. Does it harm the plant not that won't bloom that year? Or no, why? not at all. Actually, it stores up energy. It takes a lot of energy for the plants to hold the flowers. So anytime you're not blooming a plant, the plant, as long as it's growing well, right. you should be actually building up energy. Like Phalaenopsis, when they grow them in Taiwan, you'll see like if you look up Tokyo Dome Show, look up photos from Tokyo Dome Show online. Oh, Amazing the, stuff. Um, yeah, you know, like Phalaenopsis, like, right. yeah, like that. All the, just like soldiers standing up yeah. right next to each other. What they do with those plants is they keep them really warm. They keep them above 80 degrees all the time all the way up until they're two years beyond their bloom period, or until the mature plants, two years beyond full maturity. Then they drop the temperature way down and all that energy comes out into one spike. So yeah. it's the same thing with the cymbidium. As long as you have a healthy plant, because yeah. if you have it inside, and it's a problem a lot of people run into, it, they'll say, my plant's beautiful. And you see how this plant, this is a really pretty plant, right? Shiny leaves, right. kind of dark green, yeah. not always a good thing. This particular plant is typical for it. But look at the color difference in uh, the leaves on this guy. Maybe I can hold them next to each other. This is a great thing about some bidding, you can pick them up by the yeah. leaves. Yeah, but you can see lighter. more like a yellow color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really a good color for the plant, even though these are growing in the same greenhouse. Okay, so you actually don't want a really shiny, bright no. green plant. You'd rather have more of a kind of a, a yellow muted look to That's the leaves. That's the color of my Because then you know you're really getting love yeah. sun. Yeah. The other thing is, anytime you have a sympodial plant, what does that mean? Anybody besides George? <laughs> Sympodial means it puts up new growth every time. So it puts up blooms on that growth, puts up another growth, flowers on the next growth. So always putting up a new growth. Right. These are sympodial plants. You can see the progression. Yeah. Older bulbs to the newer growth. Yeah. Phalaenopsis are monopodial, which means they just grow One straight spread. up like vandas. Yeah. Okay? Anything that's sympodial, I lost my train of thought. You always want to see a progression of gradually getting a little bit larger or at least staying the same size. You never want to see the new growth come up and be smaller than the previous growth. If that happens, that's the plant talking to you saying it doesn't like some of the conditions it's in. It could be in, it could be sunlight, it could be you know, the, the, the plant starting to get too overgrown in the pot, the soil's breaking down, but all those things tell you that something's up with the plant. Uh, one thing I want to point out to I didn't mention, cymbidiums need to be potted every two years. Right have to be potted every two years. Other orchids you can get away with three, four years. Cymbidium should be done every two years. Reason is the roots will build up in the pot. You'll get a root ball so intense. We'll actually have cymbidiums that break the pot. If you look at this pot, this pot's oval. The plant's actually pushing the pot and making it oval. These pots are, I couldn't take that pot and pull it in half if I tried. I might be able to stand on that pot. And this cymbidium's pushing the sides out. I've actually seen them split the pot. So they're actually, they're that strong. And if the root ball gets that built up, you won't be able to keep it wet enough. So that's why it's really important every two years to pot your cymbidiums. Uh, right. Question? Here, what's I, yeah. when, you're, when you were saying about the, I, I know nothing about work, it's okay, I'm not, I'm not in their league at all, but I thought you said the new growth gets the flower. Mm -hmm. So the, where I, I have that dendrobium sure. I bought from you a few yeah. months ago, mm -hmm. so the old plant will not flower. Actually, dendrobium uh, it's an exception to the rule, and probably the only exception to the rule. This is flowering on an old growth. Okay. And you can see this one's actually bloomed here. Probably all these, these different bracts up here has flowered on every one of them. Okay. Dendrobiums will flower again on the old growth. Okay. Now, we don't just want to cut the old growth off because they're never going to bloom again. That's helping to support the plant. Most of them have a pseudobulb and that's storing nutrients for the plant. So we'll go at least five years. Once they get five in a progression, we'll, we'll eliminate some of the older bulbs because what happens after about six years, they'll start losing their roots. And okay. then they start to take from the lead part of the plant. We don't necessarily throw it out though. Cymbidiums have a really cool uh, thing about them. The pseudobulbs, you see how they have the leaves come up the sides of the bulbs? The leaves go out each side of the bulb. Mm -hmm. Everywhere where leaf joins in, there's a little dormant eye. They can have up to 15 <laughs> eyes on one bulb. Where the cattleya, max is three. Okay, so you have three chances. This is how I always tell people. It's like, if, the, if you got new growth, right, in nature, and some monkey comes along and knocks the new growth off, it can grow from the other side. And if that one gets broken off, it'll grow from the bulb behind it. But there's usually three eyes. First eye is you jump out of a plane and your parachute opens and you just go right down to the ground, right? Second eye is your parachute doesn't open and you pull your second cord, right? And the sec secondary chute opens up and you're still okay. The third eye is you hope you hit something soft. 
<laughs> so there's a very small chance that that third eye is going to grow. But cymbidiums have up to 15 eyes all the way up to canes. I've seen them actually grow a plant from up higher on the bulb. So there's a really good chance that they will take those older bulbs and get a plant started from the older bulbs. Thank you. So. Okay, my question. I bought all my cymbidiums from you, okay. except for one. Oh. And I got it done. <laughs> <laughs> How do I know when it was potted? Uh, From the can, time I bought it, it's, it's for a good two question. years? What you want to look at mainly is, is the plant. You see how this is against the side of the pot? If yeah. it's in the right size pot to begin with, it'll not grow the pot in two years. This is just getting to the side. So this is about ready this year. This has only been in this pot maybe a year. We only leave room usually for one growth in the pot, and the next growth should be growing over the side of the pot. So when this puts up new growth, it's going to start to go over the edge of the pot. That's the first thing. That's if it was put in the right size pot to begin with. Okay. The other way around that is right now is a great time to pot in some videos. Granddad says be done before the 4th of July. I always say granddad, it's fun. He was my dad's dad. He's the guy who started our business, so we quote him a lot, right? But every two years, what you could do is, if right now is the right time to pot in some video, you can just pot it now. And then you know when you start it, if okay. you have a question on it. But usually the plant will start to outgrow the pot. This one was just potted last year. This has only been in the pot a year. Right, you can and you can see you've got room. There's new growth actually just starting to come up. Right. So you actually have room where the plant can start growing in the pot. It's not going to grow in the pot. Okay. But by the following year, and even this thing now is going to have a tremendous root system. You'll pull these out of the pot and the roots will just be wrapped all the way around the outside of the pot. Well, so what size do you go up to? Well, that's a good question. Um, we don't want to go too big. We want to leave room, just like I said, for one more growth in the pot. And by the next growth, it's going to be outgrowing the pot. So it depends on which direction the plant's growing. A big plant like this, if we're going to shift it, we got to leave that much room all the way around it. But if a plant's only growing one direction, say like this one here, it only has what we call a single lead. This is the oldest bulb, next bulb, next bulb, next bulb's going to come up here. So we just have to leave room in front of that one bulb. So we don't have to leave room all the way around. So each plant's a little different. Just leave room for one more growth. Do you charge for repotting? Yeah, we charge about the pot size. Uh, so if it goes into, say, an 8-inch pot, it costs you about $8 to pot it. That being said, if a plant has a bunch of bugs or other problems that we have to treat and it takes a long time to handle it, if you bring us a bunch of plants, we charge you by the hour too. So sometimes people bring us 20 or 30 plants, and in that case, we charge you by the hour, how long it takes us to get them done. Okay. Any other questions? I do want to get on our next talk. Our next talk's going to be great. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll have a quick break for you to use a restroom or anything.